Good afternoon or good morning to you, uh, depending on where you are in the country. My name is Jose Leon. I am the Chief Medical Officer for the National Center for Healthy Public Housing. Thank you for attending uh, this webinar, The Impact of Health Literacy on Diabetes. And, uh, diabetes is such a great honor to be part of this uh, activity and, uh, and have someone uh, from La Maestra Community Health Center who will be sharing uh, their experience and some best practices on how they are addressing health literacy uh, in a community that is very uh, diverse. They have uh, people from many uh, parts of the world. So um, uh, it's again, uh, a great honor uh, to be uh, part of this conversation. Uh, so next slide. So if uh, we have some housekeeping uh, items before we get started at uh, this moment, all uh, Participants are muted. Um, if you would like to turn your camera on so we have uh, uh, better interaction is okay. Uh, if you would like to engage in the chat, um, you can send us questions, comments while we are presenting. If you would like to ask a question, uh, you can also use the raise hand icon and your uh, line will be unmuted. Uh, at this moment, uh, the webinar is being recorded and the slides and recording link will be sent via email within a week after the session. You can also visit our website at www.nchph.org if you have any, uh, any questions. Uh, next slide. The National Center for Health and Public Housing is um, funded by HERSA to provide training and technical assistance to community health centers. We work closely with uh, health centers located in or immediately accessible to public housing, but our training activities are for all health centers. Uh, most, if not all health centers, share the same challenges and serve uh, similar as uh, special and vulnerable populations. So it's always always important to include uh, all health centers in our uh, training and technical assistance activities. Next slide. So for today, uh, we have a couple of things. We are going to use Mentimeter and ask you some questions. And then we are going to review how health literacy affect uh, diabetes outcomes. Uh, we are going to list uh, some groups more likely to have limited health literacy skills. We are going to discuss health literacy strategies to improve diabetes care in patients with diabetes. And finally, we're going to review health literacy resources for patients with diabetes. Next slide. So this is a, a Mentimeter. Uh, if you are not familiar with Mentimeter, uh, you can use uh, a separate browser uh, or if you have your uh, phone uh, closed, you can use your phones your phone and go to menti.com and enter the code uh, that is in blue. You can also scan uh, the QR code and enter the code uh, that is in blue. Next slide. So uh, our first question, uh, Fide, if you would like to help me with the question on the Mentimeter, uh, I would appreciate that. Sure. So um, by this time, hopefully you've had a chance to, um, you know, enter the code into your browser or on your phone. Um, just give me one moment and I will share the questions through Mentimeter. All right, so for question one, um, uh, in your health center, what groups of people have you seen are more likely to have limited health literacy? And I have seen one answer already, um, education, non-English speaking patients, okay, perfect. We're gonna give a few more seconds for responses to come in. Homeless refugees, okay. All right, thank you so much. 
So for the next question is list one health literacy strategy you use to improve diabetes care among your patients. We can provide, provide your responses. We are trying to find whether you have a staff who have been trained uh, to address health literacy or whether you are using some resources from uh, different organizations. Perfect, pictorial guides, students, lining scales, okay. Printed educational materials for patients to take home. Awesome. Excellent. All right, so for this next question, uh, remember there is no right or wrong answer. Oops, sorry, going to class. All right, so this one health literacy resource that has worked the most for your health center patients with diabetes. Infographics, awesome. All right, thank you everyone who participated and I will pass it on to Dr. Leon now. All right, thank you, uh, Peter. Can we go back to the yep. slide deck? <laughs> As I mentioned, uh, we provide training and technical assistance to health centers located closely to public housing developments. And in 2020, and this is the most recent UDS data that we have available, uh, 435 health centers uh, reported to be in or immediately accessible to public housing. Uh, it's extremely important to know uh, the demographics of those living in public housing. And uh, we are going to get back to this slide uh, while we are presenting about uh, health literacy. But uh, just to mention quickly uh, uh, some of the demographics, and you see that a large percentage of those living in public housing are seniors over the age of 65, or um, and they have uh, less than a high school diploma diploma. Uh, these are some of the um, challenges where you are providing diabetes education to this population because they, in addition to these uh, determinants of health or some of the demographics that we are mentioning, at the same time, uh, they are affected. These are the groups that are affected by uh, low health literacy. Next slide. The uh, population living in public housing is uh, a diverse population. Uh, honestly, uh, all of them are uh, people with uh, who are under the uh, poverty line. But a couple of things that are important to mention uh, in regards to diabetes. Um, according to a recent report, uh, this is a publication, a CDC hot publication. Uh, 17, over 17% 17 of those living in public housing have diabetes, and over 70% have uh, are either overweight or obese. The over 35% they uh, said that they have fair or poor health, and they have other uh, chronic conditions such as COPD, asthma, and there is a large percentage of those living in public housing who have at least a one disability. Another uh, issue that I would like to mention is that um, there is a large percentage of those living in public housing who are current smokers. Um, you know the link between diabetes and, uh, and smoking. 
So uh, health centers located uh, closely to these developments are working hard to address all these uh, chronic, uh, chronic issues uh, or medical issues affecting this population. Next slide. So getting into uh, the topic that we are going to discuss today, our first question is how health literacy affects diabetes outcomes. Uh, in order to discuss uh, health literacy, uh, we need to know what health literacy is. And this is the uh, most popular definition and the definition that everybody is using when it comes to health literacy. Uh, health literacy is defined as the degree to which people are able to find, understand, and use information and services to inform their health-related decisions and actions to, for themselves, as well as others. Health literacy involves many different skill sets. The three essential skill sets are reading, communicating verbally, and understanding numbers. Next slide. So uh, as we know, diabetes is a complex condition. Once somebody is, is either pre-diabetic or diabetic, they need to understand many things, starting with uh, what the disease is, um, the symptoms, the physiology. A couple of uh, terms that probably are not familiar with, and we start to talk about insulin, we start to talk about um, pancreas, we start to talk about metabolism. So we need to be very careful how we uh, select the, the words that we are using uh, so uh, patients can basically understand what we are talking about. Um, in yellow, you see that 36% of the uh, US adults have basic or below basic health literacy, and only 12% of uh, US adults have proficient health literacy. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, this is the uh, information, but this is a, a, a chart showing that 53% are how, or uh, the population, the U.S. adult population, have intermediate uh, health literacy, and only 22%. Um, uh, sorry, solid. Uh, only 12% are proficient. So uh, it, over 35% are uh, are considered to have basic or below basic health literacy. Next slide. Same information. Uh, all these uh, numbers are taken from a study that was conducted uh, in the early uh, 2000 and still are, the numbers are still similar based on some of the studies uh, that I tried to, to find. Um, uh, visited the, the National Library of Medicine, trying to find uh, new information and the numbers uh, remain the same. Next slide. So um, again, uh, diabetes is a complex condition and patients need to understand not only the basic physiology, but the behavior uh, how does the behavior affect or impact their blood glucose levels? Uh, so we are, uh, the patient uh, need to understand the, uh, some terminology uh, about food, uh, about carbohydrates, lipids, um, fats, um, the uh, glucose and the concept of a, a, A1C or the, or the hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia and how they need to take medicines and how they have to monitor uh, the blood glucose or how they need to maintain a healthy diet and being physically active. This is not easy to understand. Um, so there has to be a communication that is simple, uh, that is easy to understand for patients, specifically if you are working with uh, some of the populations that are affected by health literacy, as you, as, as you mentioned uh, when we had the Mentimeter poll. Next slide. So uh, people with health, limited health literacy are less likely to follow uh, diabetes self-care instructions and seek care early in the course of the disease. 
which make them more likely to experience complications. People with limited health literacy are also more likely to seek care in emergency rooms and be admitted to, the hosp to, to hospitals. Limited health literacy accounts for three to 5% of total healthcare costs in the United States. Next slide. So once you have a patient who is at risk of diabetes or a patient who has been diagnosed with uh, diabetes, you need to start the conversation that you need to make some decisions um, in order to improve the outcome of their condition. So uh, the very first thing is that you need, uh, you, need to, uh, you need to verify that the patient is understanding the options, the risks, the benefits, and all the information that you are providing. Remember that this is a, uh, 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 a shared decision. Uh, you need to talk to your patient, clarify the role that they have is uh, not only taking the medicine or the insulin or the uh, oral medication, but at the same, or exercising or having a healthy diet, but at the same time, making sure that they know uh, the other aspects have the like uh, other aspect like uh, uh, like complications on when to seek uh, uh, health care if they are if they have uh, if they need food care or eye exams so all this inf information is extremely important to mention to pa to patients and it's a lot so sometimes patients uh, are overwhelmed with uh, the information that they need and, and, and it's very difficult for, for them to really understand everything that they need to do. And then you need to plan next steps and keep this conversation going. So uh, these patients are aware of their condition and they can deal with the condition appropriately. Next slide. Again, in regards to um, the uh, there is an interaction. You need to know the skills that the patient has, uh, the the capacity to understand, and that's going to affect the health outcomes. Uh, in regards to health literacy, you need to uh, you need to keep in mind different uh, aspects like the ethnicity of the patient, the uh, level of education, the age, the gender, and the disease uh, severity. And um, in regards to uh, the self-care skills, when you assess health literacy, uh, you will have to uh, refer patients to the disease management or, the, or any other programs and making sure that the patients are aware of the condition and aware of uh, what they need to do in order to improve health outcomes. Remember uh, that these patients are, you, uh, have more than one chronic medical condition. So for them, it's, it's uh, more difficult to understand uh, what is uh, uh, all, all the instructions that they are getting. Uh, patients with diabetes of, uh, often ha have um, other conditions such as um, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, they are obese, and, and they may have any other uh, 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 they may have other chronic medical conditions that we also need to take into consideration when we offer instructions to our patients. Next slide. So uh, the next question is how low health literacy affect diabetes outcomes. And uh, I really like uh, this um, slide uh, because it, sh it shows uh, the signs of how of low medication literacy and the effects on the medication use. Uh, often, uh, unable, uh, patients are unable to name or describe how to use their current medications. And that the effect is that there is a decrease in adherence, um, in medication adherence. Um, and sometimes patients have limited understanding of their medication and associated side effects. And that can increase, uh, there can be an increase in medication errors unless like a patient are less likely to take medication appropriately and ask questions to their pharmacists or doctors or providers. And that and the effect is that there is a higher risk of misinterpretation during communication. Next slide. So um, in regards to diabetes outcomes and how health literacy 
affect diabetes outcomes. Uh, we would like to to uh, present this uh, short video uh, from the American Medical Association. So, uh, Fida, please go ahead. We cannot hear uh, what they are saying, Fida. My apologies. I, I was sick a lot. Does that work? Yes. It's working. I was sick a lot because I probably missed dosage and didn't realize it. Um, I was in the hospital a lot. When they did give me medicine, I didn't take it right. I admit to it. I just didn't understand them and I didn't have the nerve to ask them the right way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have the nerve to ask them and I didn't want anyone to know I couldn't read. I can't read this. Well, I guess he doctor gave it to me, so it's okay for me to take it. When your children have fever, what do you usually give them? Uh, Motrin mm -hmm. or Tylenol. Normally Motrin because that's what my doctor recommended. How old is your daughter? She is four. She's four. Okay. I would um, give her the um, four to five, a, ta a tablespoon and a half. One capsule. One capsule. That's right. One uh, capsule. One capsule. I don't know what this is. That's twice. Twice. Twice daily. Okay. okay, so what? So how would you take this? When I say it's, it's not on, I tell you how to take it. You say take it twice daily, but it don't say what time to take. Do you uh, know what hypertension means? If I asked you what that was, because when I look at this, I think, well, maybe you have hypertension, and I've been taking care of that for a long time. Hyper, mm -hmm. hyper, like you're hyper. Mm -hmm. What does being hyper mean to you? That's that's uh. Or you can't be still, you always got to be doing something. Do I do you think I think you're hyper and have uh, hypertension? I, I don't know, I, that's what I consider it. Okay, it being you know, okay. but you know, you have high blood pressure, mm -hmm. okay? But hypertension doesn't mean the same to you. Mm -hmm. So, if I ask you if you have hypertension, you're going to just think I think you're jumping around on a chair or something like that, something different. Just being hyper, you know. Okay. All right. Well, I haven't done a very good job teaching you what hypertension is because I think you take that medicine for <clears throat> hypertension. And that's one of the things that I try to work with you on is your blood pressure. And high blood pressure and hypertension to us is the same the thing. The same thing. Dang, yeah. I have a small breakfast and then I take my pills. I usually take 16 every morning. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, for me to take these pills because if they say one tablet twice daily, um, I don't know if they're talking take one in the morning, one in the evening, or take one in the afternoon or one in the evening. So usually what I do is take two of them in the morning. And this way, I know I have them. If you have a reading problem, you go to the doctor. That can be very scary. It's like a nightmare. You walk in that office, and um, most people, if you realize, the first thing you're going to have to do if that's your first visit is fill out a form. Your heart beats real fast. You're scared. You don't know what to do. You want to turn around and walk out. I have. At approximately 30 or 31, I went into the gynecologist and complained about part of this not working correctly. And he said, we can repair that. Great. I didn't ask all the right questions. When I showed up two weeks later at the admissions office at the hospital, they put enough papers in front of me. I'll bet there were five papers that I needed to sign. Well, I wasn't going to say, excuse me, but I don't read really well. And I certainly don't read fast. And I'm concerned with some of these words to me, it was lines and circles over sheets and sheets and sheets. And I wasn't going to reveal my sense of stupidity. So I signed everywhere they told me to sign. Never read it. And then a couple weeks later in the follow-up office visit, the nurse said, how are you feeling since your hysterectomy? Now, I acted as normal as I could. Inside, my mouth fell open, and I thought to myself, how could I be so stupid as to allow somebody to take part of my body 
and I didn't know it. Thanks, Peter. Uh, next slide. So these were some examples of uh, low health literacy and the uh, difficulties that patients have uh, when it comes to understanding the uh, instructions that and they get from providers. Um, it's, uh, we saw an example of a, a polypharmacy, uh, someone uh, taking a different kind of medication for these different conditions and um, basically not knowing uh, whether uh, the, the, they had, uh, they, they, she needed to take the medication in the morning and the afternoon or evening or, or just take two at the same time or people having uh, problems reading all the materials that we provide uh, to our patients, or uh, those uh, who are just uh, not familiar with the terminology and the medical jargon that we use. Uh, best example was uh, the patient not knowing the difference between, if there is any, you know, and between uh, high blood pressure and hypertension. So those are the things that we have to consider uh, when we are working with a patient with, uh, with low health literacy. But uh, there are some groups that are more likely to have limit, limited health literacy. Uh, specifically, uh, we can mention those who have low education attainment, older adults, those with uh, lower socioeconomic status, uh, ethnic minorities, and those with a limited English proficiency. So um, according to the US uh, census, about 25 million of Americans have limited English proficiency, which means they're at risk for uh, limited health literacy. Next slide. Uh, just can see here, um, the health literacy score uh, is lower uh, uh, in patients who are over the age of 65 which means that this particular age group will have serious issues understanding instructions, uh, either from the provider, from the health educator, or from uh, any of the um, team who are going to have contact with these patients. And, and uh, it will be, you will need more time uh, when you, have when you need to have a conversation with these patients just to make sure that they understand the information that you are providing. Next slide. Same with those with uh, low educational attainment and health literacy. As you see here, uh, those who have or who are still in high school or have less than high school diploma are those who are most affected and have uh, low health literacy when you compare it to uh, uh, those with at least a bachelor degree or an associate degree. Next slide. Health literacy is also linked to uh, social determinants of health and health equity. Uh, according to the National Institute of Diabetes and, and the Digestive and Kidney Disorder, uh, Disorders, NIDDK, uh, people affected by SDOH Access uh, have issues accessing uh, healthy food and living in food deserts uh, uh, are are more likely to also have uh, health literacy issues. A structural racism is another uh, social determinant of health that is linked to uh, uh, low health literacy. And remember, the health literacy is not a trait; it is a set skill developed over time. Uh, so this is something that we need to understand that. Um, we are not proficient uh, uh, when from the very first time that you go to, to the doctor's office. I mean, you, this is a learning process. The patient needs to uh, keep learning new terminology, new uh, conditions, new information that you are providing. Uh, patient with uh, diabetes usually have uh, multi-pharmacy issues. They have uh, different uh, drugs or medications that they need to take. And this is something that they, they need to develop little by little, uh, baby steps, uh, basically. So uh, 
this is something that is not going to be like you are going to have a patient who from the very beginning is going to understand all the instruction that you are providing. Next slide. Now we are going back to the uh, slide that I mentioned on why health literacy is so important in patients living in public housing. We learned uh, in the, uh, when we reviewed the previous slides that people over the age of 65 are more likely to have low health literacy. And 35% uh, of those living in public housing are uh, 65 or older. And we also learned that those with uh, low um, uh, education or education attainment uh, also have uh, health literacy issues. And 56 or 55% of those living in public housing have less than a high school diploma. So when you are working with this uh, population or when you are working with the population uh, in your communities, in addition to uh, having all the information that you need uh, in regards to the uh, social determinants of health or the demographics of your population, you also need to link this to health literacy to, uh, and uh, by doing so, you will be more likely to provide the information in a, ma in a manner that a patient will be able to understand. Next slide. So there are different strategies on how we can improve health literacy. Um, our, the Agency of Health Research and Quality mentioned the organization health literacy. Uh, this is basically um, that each uh, health center or each clinic need to develop a team addressing health literacy in, in your patients. Uh, if you are going to work with, um, uh, uh, if you are going to develop some materials for your patients, there are materials that you are creating, uh, you need to make sure that more than one person of your team um, reviews the materials and making sure that they are at the, uh, at the uh, third grade level uh, based on what we saw in the video. Um, we need to make sure that our team is trained to use plain language and avoid uh, acronyms and, and uh, medical jargon and um, making sure that we develop easy to read material for, the, for our patients. When we have the conversation with patients, um, we need to remember that um, we need to communicate no more than three key messages. Uh, otherwise, when patients receive too much information, they tend to forget. So if this is a patient who is going to receive information about a new medication, uh, you need to be, be sure that you are mentioning the dosage uh, how often they need to uh, take this medication and any possible side effects. So uh, the, and by doing so, you are making sure that the patient is receiving the key messages for that particular new medication. So, uh, the other thing is um, that uh, we need to make sure that we use the pitch back method. Uh, everybody is quite familiar with the pitch back method. So you provide the information to your patient and you ask your patient to tell, to tell you, you know, what you just said in, uh, in the patient's own words, making sure that they understand what you have said and always uh, be positive, hopeful and, 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 and empowering. Uh, this is the best way to, to create this uh, communication with patients. Remember that these are chronic medical conditions, these are patients who are you, who are, you are going to, who you are going to see uh, at least every three to six months. This is not a patient who's coming for a vaccine. This is not a patient who is coming from, to get screened for a, a particular condition. And then you are not going to see this patient anymore. So you need to develop this um, communication and this, uh, uh, relationship with your patient to make, uh, and, and that's the reason why you have to provide uh, all the information that they need little by little. Next slide. There are different strategies that we can use uh, when we talk, when we ref uh, are talking about um, 
uh, health literacy and shared decision. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, we have uh, um, we are addressing uh, the oral literacy as well as the print literacy and numeracy. This is another big big issue. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we have patients that can not do um, some kind uh, some math calculations when it comes to uh, reading uh, food labels, for instance, and, and, and making sure that the patient understands the, the percentage of carbohydrate, the percentage of sugar in a particular uh, uh, cereal or, or any kind of food. Of patients who are unaware of uh, or not familiar with uh, if you have if you are on a medication and you are taking uh, the the capsule or the tablet is 100 milligrams and you know if you need to take half of it uh, it's better to say half of the pill rather than say take 50 milligrams in the morning and 50 milligrams in the afternoon uh, because for some patients numeracy is also a big issue next slide So uh, there are some talking points to patients uh, that, that uh, when patient with diabetes, uh, basically, uh, if this is a patient who has just been diagnosed with diabetes, you need to ask the patient, tell me how you understand, what does it mean to you uh, if you have diabetes? Um, what do you think you need to manage this problem well? Tell me what is important to you about this diagnosis and who else is involved in helping you manage the, your condition. And there will be a lot of decisions to make over time to manage your condition. If I understand something about your preferences, I will be better able to help you. So these are the part of conversations that you need to have with your patient with low uh, or limited health literacy skills. So you have a better understanding on uh, whether or not this patient will need some extra time uh, in order for you to provide uh, instruction to your patient. Next slide. Then uh, Arc also mentioned the share approach. Uh, all these are really good uh, resources. Uh, if you go to the Arc website, the, uh, um, uh, the federal website where you will find different um, um, uh, resources or toolkits and manuals on how you can address health literacy uh, uh, in your population. Next slide. Uh, ARC also developed the Health Literacy Universal Precautions Toolkit, extremely useful uh, publication where you can find tips, uh, samples, and different uh, resources that you can use to develop a health literacy program at your health center level. Next slide. Uh, these are the two resources that I just mentioned, the uh, Universal Precautions Toolkit and the Patient's Education Materials Assessment Tool. Uh, those of the ARC uh, publications that are very useful for patients with uh, low health literacy, or if you are planning to develop a health literacy program or if you are developing some uh, resources or some material for your patients, I encourage you to uh, just uh, take a look at these two uh, publications. Next slide. There are also uh, some, um, some assessment uh, tools that you can use either in Spanish or English to assess literacy uh, in your patients. Uh, it is the, extremely, these are very, very useful. It won't take more than 10 minutes to, for a patient to respond. So you can uh, assess the, um, the health literacy level of your patients if that is an issue. Next slide. The same uh, in, in uh, different language. Uh, this is a uh, assessment in Spanish. Uh, if you would like to get these resources, you are going to get the, uh, the slides and you will see the link to these, uh, to these um, uh, assessments. Next slide. Um, it is also important to mention that in addition to uh, 
printed materials. Um, um, we are using uh, other, other uh, resources, videos are really important. Sometimes you can find on YouTube videos from, from either the American Academy of Family Practitioners or the American Medical Association or from uh, universities or colleges on how to address um, uh, health literacy in your patients. Or uh, recently, uh, the use of, of uh, photonovelas is ex uh, specifically in the Hispanic population where, you, uh, where they can go and, and, and read stories about diabetes and um, using videos and pictures. The, the, these materials are very useful. Yes, the Center for Disease Control, uh, the diabetes page has some links to these uh, photo novellas as well. Next slide. So I will turn it over uh, to uh, Noemi Romo, uh, uh, that she is going to, to briefly talk about their program at La Maestra. And I am very pleased to have Noemi, who serves as the uh, Director of Health Education Services for La Maestra Community Health Centers. Uh, in her role, Noemi oversees the organization's health education, cultural liaisons, and social services departments. Noemi has a dual bachelor degree in public health and English with a teaching credential from San Diego State University. Her journey with La Maestra Community Health Center started 14 years ago as a, as a San Diego uh, uh, University intern. And then uh, she uh, became a health educator, a department coordinator, a supervisor, and now she's the director. During this time, she has received certification as a comprehensive perinatal health worker, family sharing health worker, pregnancy counselor, lactation educator, asthma educator, a child passenger technician, March of Times, Comenzando Bien Educando, Wittes Institute Project Dulce Educator, and El Diplomado en Línea en Nutrición y el Salud del Migrante. Noemi is working towards uh, ensuring that the education and social services that are offered at La Maestra Community Health Centers not only addresses the current needs of the community, but to do so in a culturally and linguistically accessible and respectful manner. Noemi is blessed to be uh, surrounded by supportive family, both personal and professional, that allows her to continue growing and learning her mission uh, at, her continued growing and learning. Her mission is to make a positive impact in the lives of those she encounters through education and support. Noemi, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Leon, I appreciate it. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation, which is very, very important, diabetes and health literacy. Um, I am the Director of Health Education Services at La Maestra Community Health Centers. We are an FQHC based out of San Diego County, a very diverse San Diego County. Um, next slide, please. Our mission at La Maestra is to provide quality health care and education, improve the overall well being of the family, bringing um, the underserved, ethnically diverse communities into the mainstream of society. Uh, through a caring, effective, culturally and linguistically competent manner, respecting the dignity of all patients. So assisting our patients to possess health literacy is part of our mission, and it takes the entire organization to achieve this goal. Next slide, please. Uh, at La Maestra, we are um, very fortunate enough to serve a diverse community. Here is a list of a few identifiers that describe the majority of our patients. So as you can see, we serve um, the underserved, the ethnically, culturally, and linguistically diverse. Uh, we have patients that speak over 28 languages and dialects. We assist and serve undocumented refugees, immigrants, uh, patients that are involved in the social, uh, in the justice system, domestic violence victims, human trafficking victims, substance use, uh, patients that are currently using or uh, managing 
uh, their substance use, mental health needs, uh, patients that are experiencing homelessness, uh, and anything in between the unemployed and patients that are living with uh, chronic illnesses. Um, so as you can see, we do have quite a bit of patients that we do serve. Yes, next slide, please. Excuse me. Okay. My apologies, there we go. Um, so again, uh, we believe at La Maestra um, that, you know, these issues, although they are identifiers um, that can be deemed as barriers to achieving optimal health, we at La Maestra also identify them as issues that can be managed and can be turned into the foundation of a person's empowerment and health literacy. And we at La Maestra believe this because many of our staff share the same backgrounds and life experiences as our patients. Our staff speak over 30 different dialects and languages. They are active members of their ethnically and culturally diverse communities. And they've either experienced firsthand or have been affected by the same life issues as our patients. This is the core understanding that we carry that allows our organization to be aware of the underlying factors that affect the overall health of our patients. And we attempt to create an environment that respectfully addresses those needs. As I stated earlier, assisting our patients to achieve health literacy takes the entire organization. We have a variety of departments that come together to ensure that the information and support that we're providing our patients is positively received. Next slide, please. A key department at La Maestra that assists in health uh, literacy is our cultural liaison department. Our cultural liaison department is staffed with medically trained professionals who serve as navigators and a, a voice uh, for our diverse patient population. Uh, they speak over 10 different languages. Uh, these are the most prevalent languages in our patient community. Um, they assist with in-house interpretive services. So for the moment, when a patient walks to the screener um, at the entrance, our cultural liaisons will assist the patient throughout the organization. For many, um, one visit requires stopping to various departments and setting up outside specialist services, all which is done with the support of our liaisons. Uh, they also assist in translative services for the organization. So our cultural liaisons also translate and review materials to ensure that the messages will be positively received by our patients. Uh, we have monthly meetings where we discuss common trends and concerns, uh, which allows us to expand our services to best meet the needs of our, of our patients. Uh, they truly are an integral part in making sure that our patients um, are achieving health literacy. Next slide, please. And another key department in health literacy is our health education department. Uh, our health education department is also staffed with medically trained professionals who serve not only to educate our patient population, but also take on the role of navigator and a voice for our diverse patient population. Uh, for our diabetes um, or our diabetic patients, through our partnership with the Scripps Whittier Institute, we have adopted the Project Dulce um, Diabetes Among Friends curriculum with the collaboration, um, the collaborative efforts of our trained educators, our chief medical officer, medical providers, and cultural liaisons. We all come together uh, to make the necessary adaptations to this curriculum to ensure that it meets the needs of our patients. Um, all of our curriculums are given at a third grade level of proficiency. When we, uh, we do make sure 
that uh, when we discuss a medical term or introduce a medical term to our patients, we are explaining it in layman's terms so that patients do understand. Uh, because many times when they do go to a provider visit, they are going to be um, exposed to those terms and we want them to know what they mean before they get there. Uh, so we do try to explain in detail. Uh, we use materials with limited wording. Uh, we've seen that that is very helpful. We promote the use of white space um, and we use images a lot in our um, handouts, brochures, materials so that um, uh, patients better understand the information that they are receiving. Since um, the start of the pandemic, uh, like many, we've had to shift our education to over the phone and virtual visits. Um, since models were no longer tools that we would be able to use for over the phone visits, we learned very quickly how to des describe concepts um, solely with words and hand out materials. So uh, that was, um, I'm sure like many, um, something that had to be done and it was done right away. Um, another essential tool that we use to assist our patients in achieving health literacy is administering needs assessments at the start and periodically upon completion of our diabetes programs. Uh, the needs assessment are a series of questions that we ask patients to better understand their knowledge, uh, to determine a personal or, or their personal strengths that we can build on um, and to identify those uh, social determinants of health that they may need to be, that may need to be addressed and supported by either the health educator, um, another department within our organization or external organizations within the community. Uh, so we do provide those needs assessments throughout um, just as our public health arena is ever changing. Um, we acknowledge um, that the organization must do the same. Our educators are encouraged to participate in certification programs and attend trainings, telebriefings to ensure that we're providing the most current information and best care. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also are fortunate enough to have a diabetes clinic. Uh, which is a designated time equipped with providers uh, that are leading in the efforts of improving the diabetes management of our patients. Uh, they assess the medical needs of the patient, but in collaboration with all other departments, uh, they're able to identify the underlying issues that can be addressed um, in order to improve the health literacy of our patients. Next slide, please. Um, so, yes, um, and so here, uh, just to recap, um, assisting our patients to achieve health literacy is not a one-person job. It is a collective effort that requires a community. Um, as I discussed, there are various departments within the organization that must work together but here are a few more components, um, which are also very necessary. Uh, we work with like-minded partners. Uh, we continue our education in-house of our staff. Um, and again, we want to uh, maintain that third grade level verbiage, the use of white space, clear, large images um, throughout any materials that are given to our patients. All of our materials are also reviewed by a publishing department who um, goes in and beautifies them, but also um, ensures that they are uh, at a level for our patients. Uh, and moving with the technological time. So we've had to make adjustments and I'm sure we'll make adjustments again um, to make sure that our patients are receiving the information, but um, understanding and accepting that information as well. Next slide, please. So um, if you have any questions or uh, would like more information, my email is down below. Um, and thank you for your time and I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you.
Noemi, a great presentation and great uh, best practices that you uh, mentioned. Thank you so much for sharing that with uh, other health centers that may uh, be looking for that kind of information. Um, please remember that at the end of this webinar, uh, there is a post evaluation survey. Uh, so uh, we ask uh, participants to to complete the survey and let us know what you think about the activities, how we can get uh, our uh, webinars improved, or if you have any or additional feedback, we always appreciate uh, your your comments and, and feedback. So uh, right now we have some time for some questions. If you would like to ask me a question, or if you would like to ask Noemi a question, please use the chat box. Or if you are, you would like to ask your question verbally, if you like can be unmuted, you can use the uh, hand raise icon at the bottom of your screen and your line will be unmuted. But we wait for uh, some questions, Noemi. Uh, can you please expand on the, your efforts that you have now uh, during the pandemic to make sure that your patients understand uh, the instructions that they get in? You were mentioning about the, uh, that right now you are offering telemedicine services, and sometimes it's challenging when you have patients with chronic medical conditions to uh, so it's difficult for them to understand the instructions. So can you please expand a little bit more on how you are making sure your patients uh, get all that the information that they need and they understand that information? Yes, thank you. Um, so we do provide a pre and post test um, before our educational sessions and after our educational sessions to kind of determine, you know, their learning, um, the, the information that they did receive. Uh, we provide all of our patients that receive um, telemedicine visits a survey afterwards. So they're able to complete a survey and give us their input on what worked, what didn't, what they liked. Um, some patients are very receptive to the telehealth visits um, because they don't have to come in. They can have the conversation over the phone we call them, uh, so it is very convenient for the patient, um, but we do acknowledge that there are barriers at times. So uh, we request for everyone to fill out that survey and just give us their feedback on uh, what is working for them. And periodically we do uh, review our curriculums, uh, the education that they receive uh, to determine if there's you know, better practices out there. Um, we also have very good communication with our providers. So when a patient does go back to that provider visit, um, they ask them as well, they follow up, oh, did you go to your, you know, your educational sessions? What did you feel about it? Did you like it? Um, and uh, we collect their, um, their data as well. Um, you know, we see if their A1C did lower or if, you know, their how their cholesterol is doing, um, their BMI. So all of those, um, those stats will also help us to determine um, the effectiveness of our programs. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for expanding on that particular uh, topic. One quick question. You also mentioned uh, that you have diabetes clinics where you have uh, different departments uh, sharing information, collaborating, making sure that everybody is on the same page. Uh, how often do you have these clinics? So the clinics are once a week with the provider. Uh, there's a, cert a certain day, a certain uh, time frame that a provider will see all diabetic patients. And during that time, there is a nurse on staff, there's a case manager on staff, that ensures uh, that that patient is connected to all the different services um, available for their diabetic care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Fide, I don't see any questions uh, in the Q&A or chat or 
any uh, hand raised. So can we move to the next slide? So uh, if you need additional information on upcoming activities or uh, any of the training um, uh, activities or publications, visit our website, nchbh.org. Please remember to complete the survey at the end of the webinar. Next slide. Uh, you can join our mailing list and get uh, updated information on different topics and uh, priority, HRSA priorities or hot priorities or any of the uh, senior programs or webinars uh, and, and uh, Medicare updates. So you are um, uh, familiar uh, and up to date with all the uh, current information um, that is a that is necessary for your uh, daily services as well as the information for your patients. Next slide. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact our, our staff as well. Uh, these are our names and email addresses. Um, once again, I would like to thank Noemi for the uh, participation, for sharing with us best practices and everything, all the good stuff that they are doing in San Diego at La Maestra. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And again, uh, all the materials, uh, including the resources and the recording will be sent to you uh, within a week after this webinar. Thank you and have a great day. Happy holidays. Thank you so much. Happy holidays.